Today, our speakers are Dana Bergman and Andrea Canada. I think I might have said that a little quick, so I'm going to say it again as the live button went on. So welcome to Success Skills Unwrapped webinar. And today, our speakers are Andrea Canada and Dana Bergman. Today's training is brought to you in part by Workplace Education Manitoba. Andrea and Dana are going to take us through exploring trades careers for women. And I'm going to, not going to let them, they are going to introduce themselves and their experience to you as they go through the presentation. So please help me welcome Andrea and Dana. Thanks so much. We are very pleased to be here. My name is Dana Bergman and um, I'm an adult educator. I live in rural South Central Manitoba and I work as an independent consultant for project development and education and training. As a woman in business for 30 years in Manitoba, I am super pleased to be involved in this webinar. Andrea and I have a shared passion for uh, the opportunity for women to gain employment in careers that are traditionally do not have strong female representation. So my history is that for 20 out of the last 30-ish years, I've been involved in manufacturing roles that encompass um, everything from working on the shop floor to the shipping department as a mailroom clerk. I've worked in accounting, in the payroll area, I've worked in customer service. I did a project in marketing. I've worked in the estimating uh, department. And for the last 12 years of my corporate career, I worked in staff development, supporting training and education. And I also had the opportunity to sit on the board of directors for four years as the staff representative in the company I was working for. Uh, for part of that time, I also worked as an independent consultant for Beauty Control Canada, who was a manufacturer and marketer of a private line of uh, quality skincare and spa products. And um, wherever I go, I am actively involved in promoting skill development, equity and opportunity for women because I know that they can add value and build a solid career in manufacturing and in the trades. I have regularly advocated for opportunity um, and had an opportunity to engage in women in manufacturing programs. And interestingly enough, had the opportunity recently to support our daughter as she journeyed the path into college into uh, a career that was traditionally male dominated as well. And so it is again, our pleasure to be here. Hi everybody, Hi. I'm Andrea Canada, I come by way of Manitoba Hydro. So I, I started working at Manitoba Hydro when I was just a, a wee baby coming out of high school and I spent 26 years with the company navigating through the administrative field. I am not a tradeswoman, but I always say I'm tradeswoman adjacent because I'm very, very strong supporter of, of women pursuing careers um, that that meet their needs, you know, that sort of meet their soul. So the time I spent at Manitoba Hydro, I was lucky to spend many years working in the field of diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. My area of focus had typically been on Indigenous uh, relationship building, and, and most, most of the time it had to do with employment, so recruitment and retention with specific focus on the electrical trade. So power line technicians, power electricians. Um, I left Manitoba Hydro after 26 years because I am also an adult educator and I wanted to pursue my dream of, uh, of working in education. I also spent some time working with the Office to Advance Women Apprentices, which is a really unique approach that came out of Atlantic Canada to support women in the building trades. Um, that was a tremendous opportunity and that's what really sparked my passion for supporting women in uh, particularly in the trades field. My passion is about expanding opportunities for people who maybe typically or traditionally have experienced challenges in the entry or advancement in, in whatever career area that they choose. Uh, we have to work to break down those barriers, all of us, and to open up opportunities for people who could be absolutely tremendous in the work that they do, but they haven't been given the opportunity because they don't look like the traditional worker. You know, when I'm in my classes, I'll often say to people, uh, I want you to just visualize a construction worker. Just hold that picture in your head. And so I'll invite everybody else to do that. And now I want you to challenge that picture because if that picture doesn't look like maybe a petite woman or a person of color, an indigenous person, that means we, we have to break down our view and our perception of what is a particular gender role or a particular cultural role. 
Uh, in addition to working with women in trades, I'm also passionate about supporting employers. So helping employers to build more diverse, inclusive and equitable workplaces. Turn over to Donna. So one of the things that we, uh, Andrea and I, have had the opportunity to be involved in for the last several months is the Empower Women in Trades program. This 12-week program was designed to support entry-level roles into trades and related occupations in three different Manitoba sectors. And so it was a tri-sector partnership. It was called a next-level collaboration uh, project between construction. So the Manitoba Construction Sector Council, uh, film, the Film Training Manitoba uh, Sector Council, as well as manufacturing. And so Canadian manufacturers and exporters supports manufacturing, agribusiness, and mining as a sector council in Manitoba. Manitoba. 43 women graduated from this program on February 9th and um, are being streamed right now into workplace environments as well as into a mentorship program that is going to support their long-term journey and career path towards success in each of these different fields. Now in each of construction, film and manufacturing there are a wide variety of opportunities that are available and so these women have been engaging in technical training, in health and safety training specific for their sectors, as well as opportunities to tour and gain industry awareness knowledge through the program that helps them to understand sort of where can they picture themselves. And that's one of the things that we really encourage them to do as we were taking tours and engaging with employers is look around and can you picture yourself here? What does that look like? Uh, several weeks ago, February 9th was graduation, practicums essentially wrapped up at that time and women have started working. And one of the things that we're working on now is engagement in the mentorship program. The honeymoon phase is over and now that we're working through the process of adapting to life in the workforce, maybe in an environment where we haven't been before, the excitement is over and, and reality is starting to kick in. And so we have this mentorship program, which is a key component in the program program to support the ongoing success. In a couple of weeks, we are having a gathering circle where we're bringing all of these women back together again to talk about, you know, what worked and what isn't working and, and what's hard and how can we support each other? Because when we know that we put women into, into, into jobs, into careers, into industries where there isn't traditionally uh, a lot of support that we need to be able to provide that support. And so we're doing that in two different ways and that's through the mentorship program and the gathering circle that are coming up shortly. When I think of Empower and the Women in Trades program, the words that really come to mind are the ones you see on the screen. It's about diversity, it's about confidence, and it's about community. And the picture that you see on the screen is Andrea, who was our program manager, and then the three sector coordinators, myself included, who supported the program. You also are looking at a group of women who represent four different ethnic and cultural groups and are only a small representation of the diversity in the Empower program. So what are the skill types to talk about trades? Well, really general definition, right? They're occupations that require generally hands-on a particular skill set, knowledge, or ability, which could be applied to really any occupation area. So I, I think we often know what trades are. Uh, there are more than 300 different trades occupations uh, across Canada. They are typically found in, in the sectors that you see on the screen. So construction, manufacturing and industrial, transportation, uh, just the service industry, as well as uh, information and digital technology. Our focus is on more of the, the building trades or the trades that you would find in construction and in manufacturing. And in, in those areas, occupations typically involve creating, right? Creating, building, constructing, uh, but also maintaining and repairing infrastructure that society needs. Without skilled tradespeople, um, our lives would not look the way they do here in Canada. We absolutely need the skilled trades. And employers are seeing how important it is to broaden the talent pool from which they draw for uh, present and future tradespeople. And that is a really good thing for equity, diversity, and inclusion getting the idea out that skilled trades are great occupations to groups that maybe typically haven't uh, considered trades, hasn't been on their radar. 
So if you're thinking of pursuing a career in trades or you're in a position to advocate or support somebody else who is looking at a, a career in trades, this is a great way to get uh, a start in your career without incurring huge student debt, um, without having to need a, a significant skill set before entry. So I'm just going to talk with you about the different avenues to get into trades. Um, you can start off with an entry level position in industry. So what we see sometimes are, are people that they're already working for an employer or they seek out an employer and, and, and say, I'd like to be an apprentice. I want to be an electrical apprentice, a welder, a, a, a carpentry apprentice. In trades, you, you're developing your skill set largely on the job. I've known people who didn't pursue apprenticeship, didn't become journey persons, but instead on the job, they developed their skill set. And they may have been a carpenter for 10 years. In fact, I know one woman who was a carpenter for 10 years. What she decided to do was through Apprenticeship Manitoba, challenge the trade certification exam. And from that, from successful completion at that point, she then can become a journey person carpenter. Now, another avenue, of course, an excellent avenue is to pursue the apprenticeship model. In With apprenticeship, there's an agreement that's reached between the apprentice, the employer who is willing to take them on, and Apprenticeship Manitoba, the regulatory body that um, manages and maintains the act uh, for apprenticeship. In apprenticeship, the balance of learning is 80-20. Is so 80% of an apprentice's time is spent on the job. So while they're on the job, they're working with a journey person, they're learning uh, hands-on, and they're building their skill set while working and while earning an income, which is a really great uh, way to, to, to pursue your career. When they reach a certain level, and, and every, uh, uh, every trade is different, when they reach a certain level of hours, then they become ready for schooling. And that's the 20%. So they're in school for a set number of weeks, depends on the trade. And they do that level after level after level. Now, different trades have different requirements. Some are two levels, some are all the way up to five levels. And with each level comes increase in pay and a, and a, and a designation as a level one apprentice, level two, level three, et cetera. Um, the direct entry approach is one approach. I kind of mentioned that before. Individuals that want to pursue their, um, their, their trades career, they're going to work with their employer. They may ask their employer to take me on as an apprentice or seek one out. That's called direct entry. But then the colleges have uh, pre-employment training programs, which are great. So if you want to be a welder, if you want to be a carpenter, you can go to Red River or MITT and uh, pursue academic uh, schooling for maybe one or two years or how many uh, years each one is a little bit different and gain the skills needed in order to then start their careers as a level one apprentice. There are what we call compulsory trades and compulsory trades can only be practiced by a registered apprentice or a journey person. So there are some trades that you can't do unless you are in fact an apprentice or a journey person. And those are ones crane operator, um, industrial electrician, those ones you must pursue apprenticeship, but there are others that you do not. Some trades are designated as red seal. So if you're trained in one province, and you, uh, you, you gain your Red Seal certification, you can work anywhere uh, across the country. Some trades that are not Red Seal trades means you would have to, if you wanted to, if you were trained in Manitoba and you want to work in Ontario, you would have to get uh, uh, Ontario training. Um, there are trades, these trades we've talked about are not the only ones. There are others that wouldn't necessarily fall under apprenticeship but they are trades or certainly related to trades. And that could be small equipment operators, assembly personnel, maintenance workers, um, in the heavy equipment or heavy industry could be operators, skilled laborers, uh, drillers. And in Manitoba, in terms of construction, about 7,600 workers or 19% of the workforce today are eligible to retire by 2032. And we need about 8,600 additional workers over the next 10 years. So there are tremendous opportunities for entry into the construction field. And construction's big, right? It's a big industry. It could be residential, could be uh, institutional or commercial, or it could be heavy, heavy construction, which is kind of bird or horizontal construction. It's, roads and, and, and that sort of infrastructure. Turning it over to Dina. 
So taking a look at the demographics of manufacturing in Manitoba, we have just over 69,000 people that are employed in manufacturing as of the end of December 2023. So these stats are fairly current. We don't have sort of the total sales yet from 2023. Those numbers are still in, in process. But in 2022, manufacturing had $25 billion in sales in Manitoba with $14 billion in exports. Now that's a big number and really contributes to the overall GDP of what's happening in Manitoba and provides, of course, lots of opportunities. And it's bringing in funding and money um, for uh, for what we have going on in the province from outside of outside of Manitoba. And that's a great way for us to expand our GDP and the and provincial earnings. Manufacturing is continuing to struggle with an aging workforce as well. So Andrea mentioned that that's, that's um, something that's happening in construction. We're seeing the same thing in manufacturing. And in the next number of years, in the next decade, uh, 15 years, we're going to be losing a lot of organizational knowledge, a lot of specialized skills uh, because of that aging workforce. And when we look at the net new and existing job needs in the next four years, we need almost 7,500 workers to replace that. And so when we think about net new jobs, we're thinking about jobs that are transitioning. And so as technology changes, um, as AI becomes part of our world as, as we engage in um, greater integration between robotics and manufacturing, we're starting to see some of the entry level roles change and move into higher skilled roles. And so some people are concerned that certain roles are um, being lost and that we're actually losing jobs in manufacturing. That's not the case. The case is that we are looking to reskill or upskill a lot of individuals who are in those entry level jobs so that they can take on more complex roles. The great thing about manufacturing is that there is strong, stable employment, even through the pandemic as an essential skill or as an essential service in Manitoba that contributed to the overall health of the economy and the stability that we experienced during the pandemic as a province. Manufacturing had a big part in that. And so there were lots of accommodations that could be put into place that allowed people to continue to work uh, in a distanced way and continue to produce the things that our world needs to live. Uh, manufacturing has a huge uh, opportunity um, for individuals, for families, for growth, for training. A lot of the trades that Andrea already talked about, things like millwrights and industrial mechanics and industrial electricians and electronics technicians and construction electricians and HVAC, many manufacturing facilities also employ uh, tradespeople from those specific demographics. In rural Manitoba, there's a lot of opportunity as well. So not just inside Winnipeg or Brandon or some of the larger centers um, in Manitoba, but in some of the smaller centers, there's really strong manufacturing that opens up a lot of different job opportunities. Now, in Canada, women in the workforce equal approximately 48% but only 29% of the manufacturing workforce is re represented by women. And for more than 30 years, this job share rate um, of women in manufacturing hasn't really changed a whole lot. Attracting more women to manufacturing is going to be a key opportunity for manufacturers in the next little while. I recently read an article on an adaptive workforce and it really called on manufacturers to look for options for job sharing, for um, uh, looking at casual work pools, those kinds of things to adapt their workforce to be able to incorporate an untapped demographic. And women are still largely an untapped demographic. Uh, Careers in manufacturing um, provide uh, high tech opportunities, they provide highly skilled, high paying jobs, and to better understand the realities, CME or Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters really provided a great resource and an action plan identifying areas that really need to be focused on in the next little while. Part of that is businesses need to continue to work on finding areas to be adaptive. Of the 38,000 tradespeople employed in Manitoba, uh, 
in the construction industry, only about 4% are women. So there's a huge opportunity here. As I mentioned, manufacturing are 29% women, uh, but we'd really like to raise the numbers in both of those industries. And why does that happen? Well, women still are a largely untapped resource in both of these sectors. And that's partly because this often isn't on our radar. We historically have not considered trades as women as an available career path. And we've also started to see that educators and employers haven't really promoted that. And we're starting to see more of that. The Empower Women in Trades program is indicative of what, uh, what it's, what's happening in the sectors in order to recognize and provide the skills and, and training support. And so we want to work toward finding ways to, um, to tap into that untapped resource in these sectors. You know, it, that untapped resource, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 54 years old. My dad was a welder and I always say, had I been a boy in the 80s going to high school and there was the opportunity there, I probably would have followed in his career path to become a welder. He didn't think about that nor did I just it wasn't something that occurred to us and the nice thing is through things like the high school apprenticeship program and and other um, opportunities that have uh, happened out in the in in industry to promote these careers these occupations among women we're seeing that change happen so what do trades women bring you know they do we know that diversity in and of itself just having a, a broad diverse workplace is better for business it creates more opportunities for creativity and innovation because you bring people together that have different life experiences, different educational experiences, and bringing those differences to bear in the workplace usually ends up being increased creativity, increased problem solving, better decision making. And so the same applies with, with tradeswomen. And this is based on uh, pretty rigorous research that's taken place over the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, According to employers that have been surveyed, women tend to be, tradeswomen tend to be uh, quite safety minded. So not that their male counterparts aren't, but definitely we see uh, women working safely, uh, following instructions, including uh, standard operating procedures, like being quite careful about that, maintaining equipment and tools well, taking good care of it and maintaining clean and safe workspaces. Now, this is not the case simply because of our gender. Uh, that's not why we're good at these things. It's because, um, you know, when you are the only one of your kind, and then that is often the case for a tradeswoman, she might be the only one on her crew that is female or even in her workplace. Um, when you have more eyes on you, you tend to be more careful. And I think the other thing is these are women who uh, have had to overcome significant barriers along the way to do what they want to do, what they love to do. And so they take great care in the, in the work that they do. Um, if anybody's read the Michelle Obama book, Beco uh, Be Becoming, um, I remember one story she talks about in there. She says that, you know, being the first black family in the White House, they had no grace, which meant that really there were a lot of eyes on them expecting them to fail. And so they had to be perfect or near perfect. And in talking with tradeswomen, Many of them feel that way. I have to be the absolute best that I can be. So just generally, why trades? Obviously, we're hoping that we'll see more women entering into the trades, uh, into trades occupations, particularly in these industries that we're representing here. But overall, for anybody that would like to pursue a career in trades, um, they're hugely in-demand careers. You've seen the numbers in construction and manufacturing. We need people, and there's some really amazing opportunities and some excellent employers in Manitoba. Um, it, it Trades careers, obviously great for people that like to work with their hands. I don't know how many times I've heard a tradesperson say, I would hate to be at a desk. I don't want to work indoors. I want to be outside. I want to work with my hands. And so if you're somebody that has that that uh, desire, this could be a good career opportunity for you. Lots of good entry level opportunities. So you don't have to go away to school to um, earn a degree or a diploma in order to begin your career as a tradesperson. Um, you can learn on the job and grow your career that way. So starting with one company, you know, right from the beginning. Uh, I know of one, one woman who is now, she's just writing her, her red seal. She's going to be a, carp, a red seal carpenter. She started in a, in a little program similar to Empower where she was learning uh, just 
fundamentals to carpentry framing. She went on, was hired by an employer and is still with that same employer. She now is prepared to write her Red Seal exam. She's uh, an amazing role model and um, I'm looking forward to, uh, to continuing to work with her. Apprenticeship is a great option. Uh, build skills without incurring student debt. Uh, the cost to the apprentice is really quite low in terms of uh, your, your financial contribution to your education. And we're seeing more and more opportunities for women because industries are saying, hey, this is, th this is an untapped resource. We have to find more women. Um, as I mentioned in the research, we know that women do really well. They tend to do quite well in, in, uh, in the field. And employers are seeing that. And in fact, in the work that Dana and I do, we've had employers say, "Where I need more. Give me more. I need more of these uh, fabulous women. So with the Empower program, as Dana talked about, we're, we're still, although the women have graduated, the, the program continues. And so what we're at, the stage we're at right now is looking for mentors and mentees. You do not have to be a woman who has gone through the Empower program to be a mentee. To, to get a mentor. So if there's anybody here that is a tradeswoman or interested in pursuing trades in, in these fields, uh, please reach out. Let us know that, uh, that you'd like a mentor. And I'm heavily in the process now of, of matching our mentors and our mentees. Uh, I mentioned before, we want to support employers. We can't, you can't, we don't want to leave you to do this all on your own. We have a workshop called Building Your HR Competitive Advantage. And in that workshop, it's a three hour workshop, um, free, and we do it remotely to make it easier for you. We're gonna talk about things like, what is equity, diversity, inclusion, belonging? You know, how to increase your engagement of, of employees, how to reach out and find people of diverse backgrounds, um, a little bit on the legal framework in Manitoba as well, as we talk about safety and we talk about the human rights code. So in the material that uh, that you'll be, uh, I believe that uh, the office here will be sharing with you, there are links to both of these uh, registration forms. And finally, just pull together a few resources for you so you know some of the things that are going on in this, in this field of uh, promoting uh, careers in, in trades for women. Um, the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum is, is an amazing national organization. They have several different programs, including a mentorship program. Uh, they have supporting equity and skilled trades. They hold conferences every two years. They also have a uh, national de uh, leadership development program. So for women who have attained their uh, a journeyman status and want to now move on to become leaders in their organizations, this is a leadership training program that is run nationally across the country, and it's done remotely. A oh, fantastic program. Uh, another really tremendous program is through the Canadian Welding Bureau Foundation. It's called Women of Steel. People may have heard about it. Uh, I believe Red River College ran a Women of Steel. MITT is running their fourth cohort of the Women in Steel program, fully funded. Uh, everything, tuition, books, materials, everything is funded. Uh, and it, uh, at the end, the women uh, are able to receive uh, CWB uh, certification uh, and are able then to move on into employment through uh, the start of a practicum. The Office to Advance Women Apprentices now has offices right across the country. Their, their mandate is to support the entry and advancement of uh, apprentices, female apprentices. There's the Manitoba Women in Construction that represents the interests of women working in all kinds of fields in the construction industry. We have women in manufacturing uh, associated with the Canadian manufacturers and exporters. They have conferences and they do a lot to support the inclusion of women in manufacturing. And then finally, our Empower Women in Trades program, which we hope to be able to run again. This was our pilot program, but it has shown to be quite successful and we're looking forward to expanding that program. All right, and now we'll turn it over to you for questions. Second, there, I unmuted. Excellent, excellent. I wanna thank you very much uh, for, for that. I have lots of questions, but I'm gonna start with this one. Does that to get us going? Yes. So my question is, how could I know trades are for me without using, I like working with my hands? Ooh, that's a good one. Well, the working with the hands, absolutely, hands down is the one that comes up the most. But, you know, if you've ever, what I hear from a lot of tradespeople is they 
kind of sometimes grown up around it. You know, they helped, you know, take apart a car or they are just interested, like what's going on inside that box? I want to take it apart and see how it works. So those are the things that generally tell people that I want to see how things work. I want to make them work. I want to create and build new things. That's when I think about trades in that way. Um, outdoors comes up a lot too. Now that's not it for all trades, but many of them will bring you outside. Roofers and uh, <laughs> electricians, power electricians and power line technicians. So those are some of the indicators um, that would tell somebody that that's, that's probably where they want to be. They might hate sitting at a desk. I hear that all the time. <laughs> yeah, there is. There's, and there's lots of, there's lots of others. I, I always wonder though, about if we understand or talk about the complexity of problem solving, or we talk about the idea of thinking skills and the importance of being able to, as you said, break things apart and put them back together. Um, and the, you know, we talk about safety and those types of things, but they're the actual amount of thinking and planning. And, you know, it's, um, Sometimes people who really like estimating as well, because when you go to a job site, you have to do lots of estimating. It's not the same type of math that we may find in like an accounting field or accounts payable, accounts receivable. So people kind of like, it's it's very interesting, uh, the amount, the skills, you know, those skills for success. Um, it also, it makes me think of the question, and I know you kind of answered it, but I'm going to poke, I'm going to poke it a little bit more if that's okay, is how is creativity and innovation part of the trades industry? So I would like to answer that if I can. And that's actually in response to your first question. That's the first thing that I thought of is if you are someone who's creative. And so if you are a woman who likes to do crafts or likes to build things or likes to put together furniture from Ikea or that kind of thing, um, you know, one of my one of my daughters will call it the um, how hard can it be, Jean? If I have the how hard can it be, Jean, then um, if I'm willing to try stuff and I'm willing to sort of figure things out as I go, um, those are really good indicators that you're going to be successful in this role because in trades, in um, in manufacturing, in construction, we're looking at largely what people don't understand is a creative role. And so the creativity and the thinking and problem solving skills that you have to have, the decision making skills that you have to have, the that are, are really a part of, of how do we build this successful career? Because very often, no two days are the same. This isn't this isn't uh, exactly the same as going to the office and, and doing invoicing every day or being a receptionist every day. Those are really valuable skills, but there's a lot of creativity and innovation that is required uh, in, in trades in particular and even in manufacturing because machinery changes all the time. You have to learn new software. You have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to troubleshoot. Um, and so a lot of machine operators are also required to be able to manage their own maintenance and their own troubleshooting and they have to integrate integrate with touch screens and AI and robotics and so you have to be able to think on multiple levels uh, on a regular basis and so how do we innovate around um, the skills that we need that's that's a really great uh, opportunity to be creative and innovative and I'll add in there, uh, collaboration when I think about the ability to work with others Absolutely. You're going to have to work with others in your trade. You might work with your journey person or your apprentice. You have to work with other trades. You may also work with the engineers, with the, the, the folks that are involved with design. So um, uh, uh, being adaptable, because as Dana said, every day is, is different. Um, being able to effectively communicate with different parties. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, the, 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 the hydro will have to come out or you have to wait and, and have to wait until, you know, underground lines are, are located, things like that. So there's, when I think about all the skills for success, they're really almost all at play in, uh, for a tradesperson. One of, the, um, one of the things to consider that I've heard other people say that just wasn't wasn't mentioned, I just want to bring share is that idea of just being able to go around the city and actually know that that innovation or creativity came because of something you did, you know, or in the manufacturing plant when they've actually created a part of a plane and then they actually take their team to go see that plane actually on site and see it live because they've been making and producing it. So it is quite fascinating. Um, people say to me to know that like I actually built that or I was actually part of that, you know, so we talk about um, pride in our work and the ideas that come from it. And, you know, it takes many, many, many types of trades to make anything come alive. So it's not one trade that usually does anything that we see. It really is, as you mentioned, the collaboration. So here's my next question. 
and I'll be looking for questions, I um, is what can we do as a society to make the movement more efficient? This movement of women and underrepresented in trades, what can we do as a society? Well, I think one of the things is to challenge the the, the, the gender roles, to challenge what we consider is, an, is a normal woman's job or a man's job. Like I, I wanna get rid of that vocabulary altogether and, and focus on desire and skills. Like, what do I want to do? And um, am I, am I skilled? Am I, am I, do I have the knowledge? I have the capacity to do that. Gender doesn't, shouldn't factor in. It's, it still does. We're, we're early on, relatively early in the stages of breaking down some of those gender, gender barriers. Um, we need more role models right? and, and that's starting to come as well. It's quite exciting to see the women that are um, excelling in their careers and going you know, beyond their receiving a red seal. Now they're, they're running companies. I think of a person like Colleen Monroe, who owns Monroe Construction, who is an absolute, you know, dynamo uh, leader in this province. So breaking down those gender roles, really questioning why we think of one gender or another performing a job. Um, Dana, any, any thoughts? I want to take over, you know, I'll just talk. Yeah, I think language, I think the language that we use can also have a very strong influencing factor on whether somebody looks at a position and identifies themselves in that role. So as an example, um, you know, if you are a drafting technologist, that's a very different feel than if you're looking for a draftsman. And so as an employer, what can we do to position our language and our communication that invites a broader set of application? Um, and and resumes that are you know for interest when we are advertising for different positions and so we don't often recognize that our language plays a big part in that and so how we position our communication can have a really big impact on whether somebody's even going to look at applying for that because a woman might look at a draftsman position and go i can do that job but if i go to the website and i don't see any women on the website and I don't see any visible minorities on the website. And all I see is white middle-aged guys in a hard hat and a vest, then I'm gonna ask myself, do they really want a drafting technician who looks like me? And so I think how we represent ourselves in terms of um, our social media presence, in terms of our websites, how we position ourselves on our websites, and then language. Those are really key things because you know, um, when I think about many of the college students that I've talked to, as they're looking for employment or seeking practicums, they're going, they're doing their research. They're very savvy and they're doing their research. They're looking up companies, they're, they're checking their Instagram accounts, they're looking at their websites, they're checking their values and vision. And so if we are not advertising that we care about diversity and we are not showing that we care about diversity, they're going to be picking up on that. And they're going to be making decisions that are going to lead them to the organizations like Colleen Monroe's where it's evident that diversity is cared about. And so in order for us to be able to make an impact and a difference, we need to be looking at the messages that we're communicating. And a big part of that is uh, representation and language. So if you were to take that and bring it down to the actual actions, so, you know, there's some actions there, but what other actions do you think um, are needed to encourage the underrepresented. Like, let's we'll just let's look at that underrepresented as a whole, inclusive of women. So we're not separating it. The underrepresented. What kind of actions do you do? We still need to be taking specific actions. Well, a couple of things. So I, I think Dan outlined some some really good ones in terms of recruitment practices, things that you can do. Uh, I'll take it to the next level when we think about interviewing, for instance. So we're assessing uh, applicants who have applied. Um, are we giving equal equal value to everybody? I, I had one tradeswoman who was getting advice from her colleagues who said, well, if you apply for the job, don't say your name is you know, Rhonda. Say your name is Ron. And that is not the right answer. You know, they were well-meaning. The right answer is let's educate the people that are doing the selection. Let's make sure that they have an understanding of implicit bias and what biases do they hold and how can they challenge those biases. So that's something really practical. Other things that the research says and the tradeswomen themselves say is, um, you know, loneliness and being the only one of your kind, that can be a real deterrent. And so 
Um, uh, we, we've talked about our mentorship program, having a mentorship, and it doesn't have to be a highfalutin program. It can simply mean pairing this woman up with another woman who maybe has worked in, in that field or, or not, has just works in that organization, understands the culture. And then another one is, is a, I guess, to call it a social network, you know, know that women are not alone. And that could be industry driven. That's one of the things that we're doing with our gathering circle is to bring women together from across construction, manufacturing and film who work in trades to let them know, hey, there's a whole community here for you. There's other women. And, uh, you know, when I've been in the presence of trades women in, in that just kind of casual conversation talking, what usually emerges is, oh, I experienced that. Oh, I, you know, that was something I, uh, but I'll tell you what I did and this is how I handled it. And so those things can be really beneficial and an employer can take the lead on creating opportunities for mentorship and networking. I'm just going to read the question out. So thanks for the info. Um, Mohammed has a question. Are newcomer women eligible to register for the program? Is there a specific language level requirement? And how can they register? Do you want to take this one, Dana? Sure, absolutely. So yes, um, in the manufacturing sector in the Empower program, 13, no, 11 out of the 14 women were newcomer women, most who had arrived within six months to a year. Uh, three of them were actually citizens, but some of them, some of the, the 11 of 14 in, uh, in my particular group um, were here on work permits, open work permits, or they were here um, as permanent residents. Um, some of them had sought asylum in Canada, so they had refugee status and had achieved permanent residency through that process. And so, so yes, um, you know, when we reached out to community groups um, as part of the recruitment phase of the Empower program, we were fully engaged with uh, Elmwood Community Resource Centre, Andrea advertised on um, some Facebook neighbourhood groups, and we had really good response from some of these groups. And this is where we saw a lot of engagement, and we had women who had incredible skills, everything from HR skills to supply chain management to, um, you know, to people who had been healthcare aides, retired paramedics. We had a huge wide array of skills uh, that we could draw on. And we had some people who had been out of the workforce for a number of years because they were raising a family and were trying to find a way to get back into some meaningful work. And so it was really open to everybody, but absolutely open to newcomers and really exciting to see um, um, you know, there's their skill development and their level because it's an intensive program. So on the manufacturing side and on the construction side, we had very low language requirements because we wanted to be able to accept people who have sought asylum. So if you're coming to Canada as an economic immigrant, you are required um, as an essential skills level to have Canadian language benchmarks or complete uh, either the CELPIP or the IELTS assessment with a certain level of language requirements. Those language requirements are not in place uh, in the same way for people who are seeking asylum. And so for those who are seeking asylum, we wanted to be able to give opportunities there as well. So we had a pre-screening process that essentially said if they were able to understand and communicate um, what we were trying to get across and could complete the online registration either independently or with support from the community center, then we would admit them into the program. And these were some of the most committed women that we had in the program. And it was amazing to watch their communication skills develop over those 12 weeks. People who really struggled to express themselves verbally were having strong sentences. And on the manufacturing side, we were able to place every single one of them in a practicum and lead to employment. And so the manufacturers have been gracious and have been working with providing additional supports where needed and engaging in the program in English while you have a translator app beside you or even a colleague uh, in the manufacturing group. We had three women who would regularly work together um, because they spoke Mandarin and yet they were able to communicate in English and I can have phone calls with them. I can understand them perfectly. I spoke to somebody yesterday and um, it's just been a real thrill to be able to, um, to be able to accept women at so many varying skill levels because language level is not indicative of capability. 
in these trades and in these um, in these jobs in manufacturing, and we did not want that to be a limiting factor. So we were prepared to provide additional supports in this area. Did that answer all the questions, Donna, or did I miss the one at the end? Mm -hmm. uh, I think what would be interesting. I think what would be interesting is um, we can. If how about at this time, maybe just so we don't. Uh, sometimes we get to end. Um, what is the website for the program? Could you just share it verbally? Actually, there is no website specifically for the program. A lot of it is housed on the Manitoba uh, Construction Sector Council website. So that's the best bet. I've also put links into the handout uh, as well as several other links that will be useful to, uh, to viewers. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'm assuming also you can look up Andrea. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, what other, how is it that I would go, I'm just going to change the focus. How would it go that I might change, how would I go about like talking to my family about wanting to be in trades. You know, like, how do I start that conversation? And you specifically, or a, or a teenager, or like? I've got lots of construction experience, actually. So, but actually, I do. Um, actually, it's, um, I'm thinking just in families. I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm interested. I've seen something, you know, I've saw a really neat video. I saw some really neat thing on TikTok on women doing some really cool stuff. How do I go about? seeing something at any age, I just want to think about you, but you know, maybe that 17 and up kind of age, how do I go from there to talking to my family? How could I start that conversation? Well, you know, I was talking with a woman this morning, actually, she, so she did have a little bit of background in, in welding. Uh, she's an artist. She liked artwork, right? Doing, I believe that was what, because I, I know of her father, um, that would kind of let her into welding and she's exploring some other opportunities. And, you know, there were, I, I shared with her, you know, the, the process, like what is the process of getting into a trade? You know, we can talk about where do you get educated or what are some really good employers out there? So that's a good place to start to, to take a look at what, you know, what will I be doing, right? Because it'll vary whether, you know, d depending on the trade that you're in, um, what does it look like? What does a day in the life kind of look like? With our Empower program, we were lucky enough to have employers take the women on tours and, and allow them the opportunity to kind of get their hands in on it. Uh, I don't know that it's it's when I've talked with people, whether the young people or even women, many women that are in trades now are women that have had uh, other careers for years and years. And they're making the change at 35, 40 or onward to go into trades. I haven't found anybody that suggested it was a difficult conversation. Right? It's like, this is something I, I think I would like to try. Uh, the pre-employment programs uh, at the colleges, the unions will often have so sometimes or even fairly short term training programs that give you the introduction to like plumbers and pipe fitters. You know, UA254 has some really great programs to get you interested in plumbing and pipe fitting. So, you know, the conversation is should always be around what do I think I could see myself doing? And what, what am I good at? You know, and, and what's the market out there? What are the opportunities that are out there that could lead me into a really lucrative career? So I'm just going to challenge that just for a second, Dana. I'm just going to challenge it just for a second. So I think it's I'm challenging it from a, a point because um, I do believe in it, right? So it's a question from a belief point that, you know, there's more opportunities. Um, my question is, is that, you know, we do have a societal view of this topic, right? We do have a society and I agree that the things you've all shared, I'm in, in line I'm in with. Um, so it, the idea, though, of just understanding, like, you know, that maybe just letting sharing people that, you know, having this conversation, it's not so much that it's difficult, it's doable, but understanding that it might take your family some time to get on board. You know what I mean? Like, it, I think that's an important part of the conversation, because for some people, that's, that's important. And they need their family on board before they might do something they might not male or female, right? It's not just a, a gender thing here at all. And so just understanding that as you are talking to your families to realize that maybe you're, you know, they might be a little uncomfortable because of the biases they hold, but to encourage them to keep the conversation, keep the knowledge going. Um, don't start of saying, if you don't support me, then like, don't create an anger spot around it. I think education can do that. I think taking new career paths can do that. And I, I like to talk about that reality sometimes and saying just, ease your family into it slowly maybe you know like if you don't just throw like or just don't throw that wrench right at it sometimes you know you may not it's just, it's not always easy for people to see a change right because maybe people want to families want to stretch and change and change and be this new movement so we just have to we have to understand it's not as easy for everybody you know what i'm trying to get at 
Yeah, so I think that, you know, even when we consider the generational gap between maybe my parents and my children and the, the differences and how they made their choices, right? Um, you know, one of my kids went into civil engineering tech at Red River and uh, graduated last year as one of only four women in her class in a cohort of 30 so that the percentage still isn't very high and so how do you explain to grandma and grandpa that you know i want to go into construction when i'm a female and and so the you know the biases that are that are there um but i think that you know having that conversations having an opportunity to have someone mediate for you and then also one of the things that i highly recommend to to individuals um, when i'm engaging with students in high school if i'm doing a training session or that kind of thing is reach out to the organization or the school that you're looking at and ask them if you can do a day in the life and so some of our children have had an opportunity to do a day in the life where they've got been able to go right into the classroom and observe they've been given um, you know tokens or certificates that they can access the cafeteria and so you know one of the things that we struggle with in in southern manitoba is that we still have a really low rate of high school students that are graduating that move on to college or university it's between 10 and 20 percent it's not very high and part of it is proximity part of it is uh the level of academics part of it is um finances and and so all of those things and so how do we do that how do we encourage that how do we support that because we want rural kids to go out and get that education and then bring it back to the rural areas because we know that rural kids are more likely to come back to rural jobs and we need all of those skilled jobs in rural areas as well and so a day in the life and, and going in to experience um, some of the smaller campuses MITT is fantastic you can reach out to the advisor group there and say hey can my kid come in and observe in the network and computer technology program which I think the name has changed now um, but can they observe in in the classroom for a day and experience the campus because if you're from a small town moving into Winnipeg to go to university where there's 50,000 people on campus any given day and you're from a town of five or 10,000 people, that can be really intimidating. Moving to a smaller campus and looking for some of these other opportunities can be much more manageable in terms of even the emotional ability to connect with uh, individuals. And so uh, maintaining that contact or looking for those abilities to stay connected or get connected with advisor groups that can give you an opportunity because um, you can often bring your parents and because you know what we want to know what our kids are doing and so as as young adults and you know early 20s um it's okay to ask for those opportunities and to reach out to somebody that can help you facilitate that if you're not sure how to do that yeah for for, for sure yeah for for sure there are all those markets um i i do just want people who maybe are sitting there thinking you know i might i am interested in this but i'm when I do bring it up, I'm not getting all the support they need. I just want to encourage you to keep finding ways to connect with them because it, it's a, it is a strong reality because I see it when I'm sitting at dinner tables. I see it when I'm hearing places. So I just want to share the um, comment here from Mohammed. He has been kind enough to put up the website uh, I believe you're referring to. So thank you very much for that. Um, one of the things you did talk about sort of uh, early on was talking about examples of upskills that we could see. So we talked about the robotics and AI. It's absolutely fascinating what's going on in those fields. What are some of those upskills that we could talk about? Maybe to enlighten us on some of those new skills or new types of jobs that are going to be there. So if you answered it, I apologize, but I thought it could you maybe use a little bit more, a little bit more depth. So you're talking about are there like new new trades? I'm not sure I can answer oh. that question. I'm yeah, you talked. You just talked. The idea was that at one time there was entry level jobs, but there's new jobs that are going to be coming up that are going to be more upscale type jobs because of robotics um, and AI coming in. And so when you were saying that, I was trying to think to myself like, what might be a consideration of an ups upskill that you know our our audience could 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 think about? That's all. 
Right. So in manufacturing, there's a lot of uh, changing and improving. So we talked a little bit about creativity and innovation. And so companies, manufacturing companies, as well as the vendors that supply equipment to manufacturing companies are lo constantly looking for ways to become more efficient, more effective, more adaptable. Um, and, and one of the things is, you know, we often talk about collaboration and working with others as a key skill in the workplace. People don't often consider the idea that collaboration isn't required just with other humans humans, you do have to collaborate with machinery. And so you have to collaborate and be able to work alongside with robots. And so robots are um, have uh, require software programming. And so, you know, as an example, if you have um, product coming off of the end of, ma of a manufacturing line, it used to be that people had to handle all of that product. Now you have boxing systems. Those boxing systems have to be programmed, so you have to engage with software. And so the role of entry level employees, the skilled, the skilled uh, or the skills accessible and needed for entry level employees is also increasing. And so while some people are concerned that those entry level roles are going away. They're not going away. Manufacturers know that they have to take the talent that they have and reskill and upskill uh, so that people are enable, enabled to engage with digital tech a little bit more. And so a really strong movement toward the idea of collaboration and digital, which are really both um, skills for success and integrating those skills for success in the workplace because of the ongoing continuous improvement cycles that uh, employers are engaging in. And so some of those are around, can I program? Can I take my numeracy skills and can I input that information to a software program so that the robot is going to do what I need it to do. And so robots don't think on their own. They need people to do the decision making and problem solving for them and the troubleshooting. And so we were seeing an elevated skill level requirement that's totally connected to the skills for success model and what was identified in that in that changeover that happened in 2022 when the federal government put that out. Um, and, and so that has a that has a profound impact on what's happening in manufacturing, um, the skills and abilities that are being identified on job profiles and job postings. And, um, and, and there's a huge, huge opportunity. Um, and so, you know, a key, a key personal um, skill is to be brave and courageous and, and be willing to uh, adapt. And so continuous learning and adaptability are a huge part of the environment. Those skills for success are absolutely key drivers in what does success in manufacturing look like in the coming decades. So quick question in regards to the um, quick question in regards to the mentorship. So did I understand you correctly that men and women could be mentors for the program? Yeah, so we have we have a couple of men who have uh, applied as mentors. They're from the, the, the painting field because in construction, the women were trained to be painters, decorators. And so we've been really happy about that, partnered up a couple of the women with men. When I've talked with uh, with trades women, who, they've, they've often said, yeah, like I have my kind of my, a guy at work who's my mentor. And, you know, we talk the technical stuff and, and then I have a female. I don't, maybe I don't work with her. She's another carpenter. And, and, and we, you know, get together and have a beer after work and talk about how, you know, some of these difficult things or crazy things that happened at work. So uh, sometimes men and women serve a different a different role as a mentor, but they're both valuable in that way. So yes, to answer the question, we will accept men as mentors. Yeah, we all have to work together, right? If we're going to make the movement we want to see, we can cannot be we have we have to stop separating the lines based on based on those definitions or labels, right? So it's a very what would success in your program look like? What is success of a woman or an under and an underrepresented individual look like? What is just a kind of as a wrap up, but what's success look like? Well, you know, ultimately getting getting employed, meaningful, long term, good paying employment is always the ultimate. But what we've seen and, and we're still early on in the journey for some of the women who've now moved on to maybe other training programs to, to get more specific te technical skills. Uh, I've already I can I can say we've had a successful program because I've seen it in the faces and the behaviors of the women. 
um, in Dana's, one of Dana's earlier slides, we talked about confidence and community. And, and we set out to create a community in this program, in the classroom and, out, and outside. And we set out to build confidence in the women themselves. And I can tell you, we saw that at the graduation. We continue to see it in our interactions with the women. There has been an increased confidence. I believe these women are going to take on the world. And they're going to be amazing in whatever career path they choose. And they have each other and they have us. And that's not going away just because you know, maybe the funding ends, the relationships are there and we will be there for them in the in the long term. Um, excellent. Thank you very much. I would like to thank both of you for your participation and being our final presenters in the Success Skills Unwrap webinar. And I just want to clarify your topic title because I used your presentation slide, which is Women Finding Jobs and Trades in Other Representative Sectors. So thank you very much for your time today. We appreciate all your knowledge. And um, yeah, thank you, Dana. Thank you, Andrea. And if anyone wants to reach you, there is the website. I will put it up one more time here. So it's front and center for everyone to find out information. But thank you for the work you're doing to build the confidence in this sector and also to build the community in this sector. So thank you for doing that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.